Franciscan community and our internet is very Franciscan. So for now it's working. Thank you, Jesus. Um, but just be patient with me if I get frozen. And if I do get frozen, take screenshots because sometimes those are the best faces. Um, so anyway, I also, like you said, I've been involved in ministry in some way, shape or form for the past 18 years, which makes me feel a little bit old. Uh, 16 of those years I've been in, in the religious life. I've been in part of the sisters. And for, since I made my vows, I've done ministry of some sort actively. So uh, first year, right after vows, I was, was working at a parish doing youth ministry and religious education. And then after just a year at the parish, I was exiled to New Jersey. Some might say exiled. I thought it was great because I was only three and a half hours from my parents, which is the closest I could ever be possibly to them. And when I was sent there, I was sent to teach high school theology. Now I went to public school for 13 years. I had zero desire to teach in a Catholic school. In fact, I really wanted to work in a parish with kids who didn't go to Catholic school because that was me. Uh, and I wanted to give young people what I didn't have when I was growing up. So going to this Catholic school and I was like, okay, great. And they're like, you're gonna teach junior theology. And I'm like, all right, cool. I know nothing about lesson plans. I know nothing about grading or assessment or any of those things, but we'll figure it out. Um, and they said, and you're gonna teach Catholic social teaching. And in, when I heard that, I was just like, first of all, like in my mind, that was just like all these crazy, like nuns with crew cuts protesting outside of missile silos. And I just did not want to teach Catholic social teaching because that was my idea of it. That was my vision of it. So I was talking to a priest friend of mine and he said, you are not allowed to have any preconceived notions about Catholic social teaching and what it actually is until you actually study it and you actually read the documents of the church. Um, and so that was the summer of 2009, 10, 9, 9, 2009, summer 2009, when he told me that, uh, and that kind of has sparked a 12 year love affair with the church's social teaching, which is so often misunderstood. And so my goal tonight is to give you a snapshot of what is the social teaching? Why do we believe what we believe? Uh, where is this all coming from? Is there any basis of this in scripture? That kind of thing. And then over the course of the next few weeks, you'll get to hear from different people unpacking very specific issues within Catholic social teaching. So bottom line, if you get nothing else out of tonight, this is what you need to know. God is love. It seems so simple. It seems like a throwaway line. It seems like one of those like kind of one of those lines we just hear all the time. We hear it from different people. We hear it in the scriptures. People throw it out to make us feel better, but it's the deepest reality. The deepest reality is God is love. And that he loves each of us individually and he loves us as his people communally. And that within his very relationship, within his very identity, that is, that, that is love. The, the way that the father loves the son and the son loves the father and the, and the love that it is expressed and given and received is this third person, the Holy Spirit. There's a dynamism to that love. It's not a static love, but there's a lot of movement to it. And so that it's that kind of movement of love that propels us forth. Uh, Pope Benedict XVI, which actually I think we're right around the anniversary of his election to the papacy uh, back in 2005. And um, one of his first documents, you know, here's this guy, Joseph Ratzinger, who worked for the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith and the Holy Office and, you know, slamming down doctrine and all this stuff. But his very first document that he published within the first year of his papacy was called God is Love. And people were shocked. Because while the first half of the document was a philosophical expose of what is love and kind of like looking at the different types of love and the way that's lived out, the second half of the document was basically Catholic social teaching. The second half of the document speaks entirely about what it means to live as social beings in community, taking care of one another. Uh, just to kind of give you a little bit more context and some resources for further understanding and um, directives. This right here, this little document, this volume is called the Compendium of the Social Doctrine of the Church. So basically, it, the first edition came out in 2005, shortly after Pope Benedict was elected. Uh, it was republished again in 2009, I think with some updates. And within this document, I just want to show you like, this whole thing right here is all just um, like a, an index. So you could look up any any issue like criterion for judgment, uh, cultural, um, cultivating cultural values, education, ecosystem, like you name it, it's all in there. And it's going to have like a little bit of an explanation for it. And then also show you where to go in other documents. Another great uh, little resource for you is the Catechism of the Catholic Church, the CCC. My friend, my students would call it the Catechism of the Catholic Chicken because they just thought it was funny to change what the C's all meant. Um, but anyway, this, all the stuff on Catholic social teaching is found, there's four pillars. The first pillar is what we believe. The second pillar is the sacraments, like how do we express what we believe? The third pillar is how do we live what we believe? And the fourth pillar is prayer. It's kind of the umbrella that goes over all of it. So anything about Catholic social teaching is found in the third pillar. How do we live out what we believe? And it's in the context of the commandments. 
But before we even get to the commandments, there's a whole thing that talks about what does it mean to be a person? What does it mean to have reason and intellect and will? What does it mean to have freedom? What does freedom even mean? Uh, what does it mean to have a conscience? What does it mean to be able to make judgments? What's the morality of an action? And then it gets into the commandments. And within that, uh, it gets into what does it mean to live in community? So again, if God is love, going back to that very basic principle, God is love, God is this communion of persons. So our understanding of how to live in society is based on the reality that we believe in a God who is communion and that we're invited to share in his very life by living in communion with one another. So CST basics 101, if you're taking notes, um, you know, I, I have this like uh, this drawing, if I were drawing on a board in front of you and I don't have an iPad or anything fancy like that, that I could like draw pictures on this and plus I'm a terrible artist. Uh, actually, that's not true, I'm getting better. The grid changes everything. Let me tell you, I started painting some things recently and I'm like, oh, I actually can draw, who knew? Um, so if you're, if you're taking notes, you can start by drawing a tree because that's actually what we're going to talk about, the tree of Catholic social teaching. So the tree, the very first part of a tree is what? Like when it starts to grow, it creates a root system. So the roots of Catholic social teaching are all found in sacred scripture. You might call them the scriptural roots of what we believe. And so this goes all the way back to the book of Genesis, right? The very first chapter of the book of Genesis where we see God creating, God making his creation. He creates everything from nothing. He creates this structure and then he creates order to this structure. Um, St. Scott Hahn, when he talks about kind of the creation story, or if anyone's doing Bible in the Year with Jeff Cavins and Father Mike Schmitz, uh, this whole idea of the realms and the rulers. So he creates the sky, but then he creates uh, the, the heavens and the earth, rather, and then he creates the great lights to govern the sky, the, the, the sun and the moon. That's, that's later on. So the first three days are the creation of the, the realm, and then the second three days, the creation of the rulers. And he gives man specifically dominion over all of his creation. And of course, as creation progresses, it gets more complex and complex and complex. And ultimately the human being is the crowning glory of creation. And we're created in the image and likeness of God. And so number one scriptural root is right there, all the way back in chapter one of Genesis, that we're made in the image and likeness of God, that God has created this world for us to live in and that he invites us to live together in harmony and in the communion. But also back in chapter one of Genesis, actually chapter three of Genesis, way back in the beginning, we see this rupture that comes through sin. And the rupture, of course, is uh, there's a disruption between our relationship with each other, obviously, our relationship between man and God, obviously, even our relationship within ourselves, but also the disharmony in creation. And that's why so often through the prophets, we hear, especially in the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah is like a uh, master of Catholic social teaching, a lot of roots in there too, uh, speaking in his words about the restoration of all creation. He talks about how the wolf's gonna lie down with the lamb and the child will play by the adder's lair, right? Why is this? Because all creation will be restored and there's this restoration uh, where there's order that's brought back. And so ultimately as, as Catholic Christians living in the world, like to live Catholic social teaching is to, to begin to understand and to begin to reorder creation according to God and who he is according to his plan. Now, he does this, he's the one who gives us the grace to be able to do it. It's not like we're gonna like go fix, out, fix the world. Um, God's the only one who can do that, but we cooperate with him and we begin to live more who we are and more in his image and likeness, and more living out the love that he pours into our hearts that he invites us to share with others. And as we do that, that's what begins to transform the world. So God is love. God is communion. To live Catholic social teaching is to live like God. We see these roots in the scripture. Obviously, the, the highlight, the pinnacle of, of salvation history comes with the incarnation when Jesus Christ becomes man. And he changes everything. And he's kind of radical. He's kind of a radical revolutionary. People are a little bit taken aback by the way that he speaks to women, uh, by the way that he interacts with the outcast of society. And really, he gives us the pattern for living a gospel life. So for living a gospel life that takes care of each other, where we take care of our neighbor, where we take care of the poor and the outcast, where we're not afraid to interact with them, where we kind of reorder even the structure of the political realm in some ways is reordered by Jesus and the way that he challenges some of the, the beliefs of the day and some of the movements of the day that were given there. So from the scriptural roots, whether it be in the Old Testament rooted in Genesis or the prophets, um, or then moving into the New Testament where we see, of course, Jesus is the highlight, the, the incarnation, Jesus showing us how to live, how to love. Uh, we also have the writings of St. Paul, which speak a lot about living in community because he was writing to the early communities of Christians, or we can look at the Acts of the Apostles. How did the early church live? The early church lived, they were one with all their things and they shared and everything was held in common, not in a communist kind of way, but in a way that nobody needed for anything. Uh, we're hearing in the Easter season in the daily mass reading cycle about when the first deacons were ordained. Why were the first deacons ordained? They were ordained for service 
because the widows were being neglected in the daily distribution of the bread. And so there, there was this need like, oh, people are being left out. People don't have what they need. We need to make sure that they have what they need. So we're gonna, we're gonna ordain these men specifically to be looking out for the outcasts, to be looking out for the poor. So from those scriptural roots, we then, the, the, those roots are fortified by like the trunk of the tree, if you will. And the trunk of the tree would be the magisterial documents that our church throughout salvation history, from the very time that Jesus gives the keys to Peter and entrusts him with leading and guiding the church, we've been, we've been blessed with popes, most of them good, a few of them bad, but we've been blessed by the, the assurance of the Holy Spirit living and breathing in, the, in, in Peter. In Peter, and we have right now Pope Francis, of course, who's given us lots to think about in terms of, of social, the social teaching of the church and his document, starting with the light of faith, but then most recently in his document on, on harmony, fratelli tutti, right? Uh, what does it mean to live as brothers and sisters? Or, or a few years ago, several years ago now, I guess, Laudato Si, his document, which speaks about care for our common home, care for creation. But the very first document on Catholic social teaching, there's kind of a landmark watershed moment in, in the history of the church was in 1891. So we're coming up, actually, this is kind of a, a milestone year, 130 years, right, since this document came out. And the document was called Rerum Novarum, or Of New Things. The Pope of the time was Pope Leo XIII. And if any of you were studying history or you know what was going on in the world in the late 1800s, this, of course, is kind of the height of the Industrial Revolution. And so in the midst of the Industrial Revolution, there's all these new things, there's all this new technology that wasn't around, obviously, in the time of Jesus. He didn't know how to navigate that. He didn't know how to teach us how to navigate that. And so because the church is mother and teacher, she seeks to, to explain to us how do we live these basic principles, these scriptural roots, these very basic principles of our faith as things unfold and progress in the society and in the world. And so Pope Leo XIII recognized that with the with the Industrial Revolution, with the advent of things like factories, people were leaving the farms and moving to the cities, uh, which made, meant the family suffered because the father was working more often. Uh, but also the, there was a need to protect the rights of workers who didn't have great working conditions and you know, worked a lot and didn't get paid very much uh, to be able to care for their families. And so all these things were affected by that. And so in his document of new things, Rerum Novarum, he gives us kind of a, a worldview and a vision for how are we to move forward a few years ago, I read a pretty awesome book. It's called The Human Person. It's by Father Brian Bransfield, who's actually a priest of the Archdiocese of Philadelphia. And in the document, it speaks primarily on the, on the writings of Pope John Paul II and his understanding of the human person. But Father Bransfield, what he does is he shows how what John Paul II gave us in his theology of the body in the 80s was actually a response to the three revolutions and the very first of those revolutions was like a perfect storm of these re revolutions. The very first of the revolutions was the Industrial Revolution. And then the second was the sexual revolution of the 60s and then the, the um, what he calls the technological revolution of the 80s and the 90s. So um, that our understanding of the human person is skewed because of those three things. And Pope John Paul II seeks to restore that to give us an understanding of that. So in a lot of the, the writings of Pope John Paul II about Catholic social teaching, he gives us a vision for the human person and helps us to understand what it means to be human and how we're to live in society with each other. After Pope Leo XIII in 1891, um, there have been several like anniversary documents from, from that. So like in 19, uh, 1931, there's Quadragesimo Anno. So 40 years later, um, little, little fun fact, Catholic nerd fact. If you ever wanna know where popes get the names for their documents, it's just from the first sentence and they translate it into Latin and take the first couple words and it sounds really fancy. Uh, so back in, in 1991, the 100th anniversary of Rerum Novarum, Pope John Paul II gave us Centissimus Anus, AKA 100 years, right? So um, it's really not fancy. It's just the first, first, few, first few words. Um, so Pope Pius XI gives us Quadragesimo Anno 40 years later after, after Rerum Novarum. And obviously in 1931, other things were happening. World War I had just finished. World War II is kind of on the horizon. And so looking at, how is the world different? How does the church respond to what's happening because right, right now in the world and, and as things are now? Uh, pope, pope John the Twenty Third is also a great Catholic social teaching pope. He was pope from uh, 1958. Wait, no, I'm getting my years a little bit confused, but late 50s, and he died in 1963, June 3rd, 1963. I remember that because it's 6363, and it's just easy to remember. But he wrote a great document on peace. It's called Pacem in Terris, Peace on Earth. And so that document is a, a landmark Catholic social teaching document because no longer are documents at one time were addressed to like priests, religious, and the faithful of the church. But Pacem and Terris is the first time that a pope addresses the document, not only to priests and religious and all the faithful of the church, 
but to all people of goodwill. And he kind of opens up like, hey, this is actually for everyone. This is not like just because we're Catholic, we believe this. Like this is rooted in like who we are as human beings. And there's that invitation to live peace on earth. Um, I would argue, my name's Sister Carolyn, by the way, is spelled with a K. I don't know if that's been out there at all, but I'm named for Carol Wojtyla, who is Pope John Paul II. So I, I like to argue that P JP two Pope John Paul II was probably like the Catholic social teaching Pope in a lot of ways. First of all, because he wrote a lot, um, but second of all, because his understanding of the human person, his understanding of suffering was so formed by his own experience as a worker in the mines, as a worker in the quarry during World War II, um, as, as someone who lived in a country that was invaded. Like, how do you navigate living as a Catholic under a communist regime? And then, you know, the, the Germans left and the Russians came and they had all these different things that they were living under in Poland. I mean, the man himself was ordained secretly in a ceremony. He, he, he knew a thing or two about how to navigate politics, how to navigate the political sphere. If you ever wanna watch a good documentary, it's called Nine Days That Changed the World. And it's about his first trip back to Poland after he was elected Pope. He wanted to go there for this huge celebration that the country was going to have in honor of the, the baptism of Poland and, and Christianity's arrival in Poland. But the government at that time was like, heck no, we're not letting you come back for that. You're gonna incite a riot. So it kind of compromised and they allowed him to come later. Um, but you know, the Holy Spirit, he, he, they didn't know this, but he came over Pentecost weekend. So the Holy Spirit's not going to leave that untouched. And a lot of cool things started to happen in Poland after that very moment. Um, his document, Pope John Paul II, specifically, I want to highlight 1981. So there's another significant anniversary of 1891. 90 years later, he writes a, a document called Laborum Exercens on the dignity of human work. And again, this came out of his experience of being a worker in the quarry and knowing what it meant that, that hard work actually is a good Good thing about being human that we have this capability uh, we have a cap capability to work and to cooperate with creation and to cooperate with the, the goods in the world that god's given us uh yeah those are there's just there's a few uh, kind of some highlights i mentioned already pope benedict the 16th his document in 2005 god is love uh and then in 2009 like, i'm just trying to think timing wise i started teaching in 2009 and that was the year that his document caritas and veritate came out so that's the Latin is charity and truth. Basically, he's like, I want to tell you the truth, but I'm doing this because I love you. And that came out right in the wake of the housing market crash and like the, the just the economy tanking kind of worldwide. We experienced it very much so here in the United States, but it was a worldwide phenomenon. And it's a document where he addresses that and he addresses uh, kind of the problem with the market and the problem with the free market that, you know, it used to be, we used to live in a world where you would bring your cows to market and someone else had their eggs and you would trade milk for eggs. And there was a, a, a face behind the name. But we live in a world now where we carry a piece of plastic. Well, you do, I don't, I take a vow of poverty. You carry a piece of plastic in your pocket and you swipe it and there's no inter human interaction there with that transaction. And so we've lost something in the, in the working for things and like paying for them as we work for them versus just like, oh, I got this piece of plastic and that'll work. Um, my students would tease me because I, I would get on a soapbox about this. Right uh, several years ago, when I first started teaching, is kind of when those um, automatic cashier things kind of started at stores, where you would go and you didn't actually have to interact with the cashier. You could just go to like self checkout, and I'm just going to go check myself out, and I'm going to scan all my things and then swipe my card. And so I actually I have like a an aversion to that, and I I I do it in the name of Catholic social teaching. Like even if it would be quicker, I will stand in the line and I will look at the person face to face. Uh, because I just think it's really important to have that human interaction. And it, yeah, does it take longer sometimes? Absolutely. Uh, but how, how often do I do things like to, to take the easy way out, like in the name of convenience? And if we start living our lives in the name of convenience and we start taking human beings out in the name of convenience, that's a slippery slope. And I think we can see some of the ramifications of that happening today in our culture. So scriptural roots give way to the magisterial documents that are trunk, the trunk of the tree. And then, then we have the branches. So this is how kind of the, the synthesis of all the document, all the things that are in scripture, all the things that are in the documents. The church gives us seven major themes that would become like the branches to this tree, if you will. And there is an order to these branches. And it's important that we keep this order to the branches. The very first and foremost is human life and dignity. That probably doesn't come as a surprise to many of you. Uh, that human life and dignity would be at the forefront of our understanding of Catholic social teaching. Again, going all the way back to the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter one, right? And meet where he made in the, human, in the image and likeness of God. And so there's a dignity that human beings have that dogs don't have. And you might be a dog lover. That's totally fine. I get that. I'm a Franciscan. We're animal people. I'm not personally, but you know, that's fine. That's your thing. But the human person is the height of God's creation. 
And so we have an obligation to honor, to respect, and to uphold that dignity that we're given, that dignity that can't be taken away. That dignity, you know, we, we speak about the inalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. These inalienable, inalienable rights that are given to us by our creator. You can't take that away. And so the importance of upholding human life and dignity at all of its stages from natural conception to natural death. Um, now you're going to notice as I start to, to bring out these branches, you're probably already thinking of some of the issues that might surround the branches. Just for your own visualization here, if, you, if the branch of Catholic social teaching is human life and dignity, then the leaves that are on that branches or the fruits or the flowers that are on those branches would be things like euthanasia, abortion, um, sex tra human sex trafficking, actually, human trafficking. Like these are all like the, the issues that would go along with the specific um, kind of the specific theme. And those are going to be some of the nights that you have later on in this semester and later on in this series. You'll get to hear more about some of those hot button issues, if you will, um, that really come out in, in our understanding of Catholic social teaching. And feel free to ask lots of questions about that because they are things that need to be grappled with, right? There's not going to be this clear and definitive, like, this is it and period. Like, there's always these gray issues and these, these gray situations and scenarios. Yeah, but, but. And so it's really important that we have the underlying understanding of the roots and the fortification in the, in the trunk and then the branches so that when we are confronted with the issues, because let's be honest, some of these issues weren't around 2000 years ago. Jesus wasn't dealing with these issues. So what, what gives the church the right to teach about them? Well, she's a mother and she wants us to understand what our Lord and Savior, the founder of our church, would want us to know, even if those things were just a blip on his radar back then. Like, okay, someday this is going to be a thing, but for now, it'd be too much for you if I uh, to sit down all the apostles in the upper room after Pentecost, or after the ascension and say, okay, now there's this is going to happen in 2021, and this is going to be a political headline that's going to come across, across their radars, and so this is what you need to teach, right? This is why we have the living teaching authority of the church that comes with us and brings the gospel basics into our society today. So theme number one, human life and dignity. Theme number two, the call to family, community, and participation. The family is the basic building block of society. Pope John Paul II says that as the, as the family goes, so goes the nation. And so this understanding of the importance of the institution of marriage, or the importance of children having a stable, uh, stable ground to be able to grow up in within a family, that parents have rights. Parents have the right and the responsibility to educate their children in the way that they desire, in the way that they will be best cared for, and the way that they will be best able to flourish into, into healthy adults. Um, so there's a family in that regard, but then also something I've always wondered how I could get Parks and Rec into a um, Catholic social teaching talk, and I think I finally figured it out. It's right here. So the call to, the call to community, that we're, we're social beings, that we're made to live in communion with one another. We're made to live with each other in community, whether that's in a family, but then also in the wider community. I mean, obviously, I live in a religious community. I live with 50 sisters, so if we're not living Catholic social teaching, I don't know what we're living. Uh, but, you know, you're living in as part of a university community, as part of a Newman Center community, that there are things that you need to do for each other. There are things that you can do that the person next to you can't do. There are things that they can do that you can't do. When we live in community, that's when things are really beautiful. We can give ourselves to each other in a very similar way that reflects the Trinity. We make a gift of ourself and we were able to receive the gift of the other and recognize each other's needs. And we first learn how to do that really in the family. We learn how to, I, I mean, I have a brother and a sister, they're twins, and I'm the, I'm the oldest of the three of us. And when they were born, I learned real quickly that I was not the center of the universe. And so I had to learn how to navigate that. And those lessons of learning how to navigate that when I was three and a half, four years old, have come with me throughout life uh, to be able to recognize my contribution to society. I remember being as young as fourth grade and our parish asked for help um, decorating the church for Easter. I'm sure they weren't asking for a 10 year old to come and help, but hearing that announcement at church, it like spawned something in me like, I have something that I want to offer. Um, when I was in grade school, my town built a playground and I, this is actually a very formative experience in my life, but they wanted the, the children of the town to have buy-in. So we did all these fundraisers and then the day itself, when they constructed the playground, we were all invited to come and help. And so like my dad helped with actually like the sanding and the sawing and the, and the, and the drilling and the, the hammering. But as the little kids that were there, we would like bring the wood to the dads or we would like wash the tires that were gonna be used for the tire swings and everyone had something to contribute. It sounds so silly, but really this is part of living Catholic social teaching that we live as part of a society, like a neighborhood cleanup. Like doing that is actually part of living out Catholic social teaching as part of beautifying the community and making it well, uh, making it beautiful. So that's what makes me think of the show Parks and Rec, which I just discovered during the pandemic. And I'm like really mad at anyone who knew about it beforehand and didn't tell me. So anyway. 
I don't know you, so you're not responsible for that. But I have friends who I'm like, why did you never tell me the glory of Leslie Nope and Ron Swanson? I just, I don't understand. Third uh, branch of Catholic social teaching is rights and responsibilities. This kind of goes along a little bit with the cult of family and community and participation, but the understanding that all of us have basic human rights that are given to us, but then we have corresponding responsibilities. Like if we're given this dignity, then we need to live that into our, our society. We need to live out our dignity. Um, if we are given the right to, uh, to, to freedom of speech, then we need to use that freedom of speech responsibly. And I can just throw that out there as, as one particular example. Um, but this is why it's important that we have governments that actually respect our rights and that allow us to live out our responsibility. That's why part of Catholic social teaching is making sure you vote. Um, we recently had a uh, like a local election, like, you know, little small town, Illinois, what's the big deal? There's like all these like trustees and like the trustee of the local community college and like the, the library board of trustees. And I'm like, who, who even knows? Like, I don't know these people. Like, why does this even matter? Like, what's the big deal if I even bother to go vote? Um, but I was reminded of my rights and responsibilities that part of Catholic social teaching is is contributing to that, is like actually doing a little bit of research. I'm really grateful we have this one sister who's very politically minded and she will do all the research in the world to like find out like the, the local most basic circuit level judge, like what his positions are and what cases he's decided. And she'll kind of put it out there for us so that we can we can kind of study up before we vote. Um, but it's important to, to vote on the most local level because eventually many of the people who are running on the local level will climb the ladder and be running on a higher level. And so the more locally we can be involved and, and use, live our responsibilities within the local community, the better we're able to actually contribute to the greater society. Uh, part, of, part of rights and responsibility is also a principle of Catholic social teaching called the principle of subsidiarity. And essentially what that means is that decisions should be made on the most local level possible. Uh, there was a lot, uh, I, I last year during the pandemic lockdown stuff, I was like wishing that I was teaching Catholic social teaching at that time, because there are so many examples, right? We had people who are on this high, high level making, calling these shots for people in the small town Iowa that are socially distanced just by, by the nature of the way that they live, right? So uh, it's very interesting that the way that it all came down. So subsidiarity, like for me in my life, um, if I can make a decision based just with my superior who's in charge of me on a day-to-day -day basis, I can make that, she can make that decision for me. But maybe sometimes there's something that she's not, she can't call that shot. So then together we need to go to mother who's a little bit higher than her. And then sometimes she can't even call that shot. So we got to go to Reverend mother who's way over in Germany to find out what I'm supposed to do in the situation. But if I need to know like, hey, what kind of toothpaste should I buy? I can just go to my local superior about that. And to be clear, I, I don't really have to ask that question. I'm a Crest kid all the way. So for what it's worth. Number four, fourth branch of Catholic social teaching is the preferential option for the poor and vulnerable. And this is one that is just, I, I love this one very, very much. Uh, and th this, I just have a heart for the poor. I'm a Franciscan. So Franciscans like hanging out with the poor. Our community doesn't necessarily have any direct ministry with the poor, but I get to travel quite a bit in my work as a vocation director. And so like even just last, last Wednesday night, like a week ago, I was at Iowa State University and I was like 8.30 at night, I was getting ready to leave and this homeless woman stumbled into the chapel and her name was Jessica and I prayed with her and I gave her a rosary and I offered her um, some, some other additional help that I could at the moment and um, just things like that really amped me up because it gives me an opportunity to be the heart of Jesus and to love another person with the heart of Jesus, especially those that, the, that society literally has cast off. Um, and her story, I don't know the entirety of it, but it sounds like from what I did get of it, there's a, there's a lot to it and a lot of ways society has cast her out. And so it was a beautiful opportunity for me to just bring merciful love and, and to really seek her out. Um, you know, one of the things I, I mentioned, her name is Jessica, right? I think one of the basic ways that we can live a preferential option for the poor and vulnerable is actually recognizing someone as a human being and asking their name. So um, I don't have money to give out because I think about poverty, but I always travel with extra granola bars and there's like certain areas, I live near St. Louis. So there's certain areas of St. Louis. If I'm driving there, I'm going to bring some extra, extra granola bars because I know I'm going to encounter a lot of people. And so just even asking someone's name, offering them a granola bar and then asking to, offering to say a prayer with them is a beautiful way to live out the preferential option for the poor and vulnerable. Uh, just recognizing that we all have needs and some people's needs are a little bit greater and a little bit more in the forthright. Um, but our hearts, like just like Jesus's heart was moved with pity when he saw the crowd that was hungry, like to allow our hearts to be moved with pity in the same way, to have compassion on those who have, who have a need that we can fulfill. So you're going to hear a lot about that on one specific night later on in this series. 
The fifth of the branches is the dignity of work and the rights of workers. I already kind of mentioned this back when I was talking about the Industrial Revolution in 1891 and what that looked like for people going into the factories. Uh, my favorite image of like dignity of work and rights of workers is the movie or musical Newsies. That's actually my introduction to the understanding of uh, of the dignity of work and rights of workers, right? They strike. Why do they strike? Because they need their rights because they up the prices. And um, so anyway, if you haven't seen it, you should. It's delightful. It's one of my favorite movies of all time. Um, and so the, to recognize that it's important that wages are fair and that benefits are actually beneficial to people and that people have what they need in that regard. Um, again, Pope John Paul II wrote a document specifically on this, on the dignity of work. And one of the things he says, like, it's actually, it's good for the human soul to work and it's good for us to use our bodies in that way. Um, and maybe some of you have that experience of like you're studying all the time and you're behind a computer screen most of the time. And there's just something about like going outside and raking leaves on a fall day that just opens up the soul. Sometimes just doing those manual labor and those manual tasks, like really, really is a way that we are able to become more human. Um, that work actually is part of our humanity. God himself gave Adam the command to work even before it seemed like a punishment. Um, he actually gave him the work to till the garden and, and, to, and to be a good steward of that. And we'll get to that in a second. The sixth theme of Catholic social teaching, I'm like running out of time here. So we're just, we're just like running through here, but it's solidarity. Um, solidarity, meaning that we are one human family and that we should have as much of a care and a love and a compassion for the person next to us as we do for the person who lives oceans away. Uh, and I think we do a good job of this when there's a like an international tragedy, you know, there's some earthquake somewhere and we're all like really moved to help with that or we're moved to, to go forth and to bring aid in it and things like that. So I would say like within this document, within, within this of the branches, within, excuse me, within this branch, some of the issues might be war and a concern for, for war and, and aiding people who are in war-torn situations. And also with, um, uh, gosh, like, yeah, any kind of a genocide, while that is a human life issue, that actually also has to do with solidarity. So um, looking at that, and then um, finally, yeah, just relief, like international relief. I would also say that missionary work is somehow a part of solidarity, that why do we go on mission? We go on mission to bring the good news, and the good news comes in the form of the gospel proclamation, yes, but sometimes the good news comes through the, a clean water well. Sometimes the good news comes through bringing food to, to places that don't have food. Um, so yeah, just recognizing our solidarity with our brothers and sisters that maybe we can't see. I, I'm, I'm mindful of John, uh, Matthew chapter 25, right? Jesus says, whatever you did for one of the least of my brothers, you did for me. Um, immigration, again, hot button issue, pretty controversial, but I would say immigration is part of not only human life and dignity, but also the call to family, community participation, rights and responsibilities, and solidarity. Solidarity, actually, I would say primarily, if we were going to kind of put it in one specifically. And then finally, the last of the branches of Catholic social teaching is stewardship of God's creation. Some people might say care for God's creation, which is fine. Um, but I think the word stewardship is really important because what is a steward? A steward is someone who's entrusted with, uh, with a care for something that goes beyond just like, oh, yeah, I'm going to take care of it and make sure it doesn't die. Uh, but a steward cultivates and makes something grow. And so um, God gives us his creation, the, the beauty of creation. I'm an East Coast girl to the core and I miss the ocean because the Mississippi River just does not cut it in terms of bodies of water. But like, there's something so beautiful and such a gift to stand before uh, God's creation, whether it's the ocean, whether you're an ocean person or a mountain person, either way, right? Uh, there, there's gonna be some real beauty there to be able to appreciate. This is where like, yeah, we should take care of the animals that God's given us, but also God gave us, gave us dominion over the animals. And so a care for animals that says, all right, I'm not gonna like run over a cat on purpose, but like also I'm going to eat a hamburger, which I did tonight and it was delightful, right? So that these are all kind of like finding a balance within that, that God has given us his creation to use, but not to abuse. Um, I sometimes when I was teaching Catholic social teaching in a high school setting, I would use Dr. Seuss books for each of these. So, you know, Horton, here's a who, very obvious connection with human life and dignity. And then the Lorax is the obvious connection with stewardship of God's creation. So just let it grow. That's all I'm saying. If you know, you know. Um, yeah, so just to be a good steward, so pollution um, or, or understanding climate change, all of these things are part of, of that seventh pillar of Catholic social teaching, some of the leaves on the branch, if you will. Whew, there we go. That is like the major overview. Um, 
total oversimplification probably in a lot of ways, but just to give you a framework for the things you're gonna be hearing in the coming weeks. And as the speakers in the coming weeks are speaking for you to be able to kind of put that in perspective, like when they're speaking about human sexuality, like where does that fit in? Oh, if it's in with human life and dignity and with the call to family, uh, when someone's speaking about poverty, looking at how that fits in with the preferential option for the poor, racism. I, I would say racism is you know the issue of our day in a lot of ways. And so recognizing how that's probably part of, part of human life and dignity first and foremost, but also part of solidarity, also part of rights and responsibilities, there's going to be some overlap um, for sure as, as you're hearing about, about CST. I mentioned to Jewel that just in my prayer, uh, before I came up here, we have evening prayer, and then I had supper, and then I ran up here to, to jump on this call with you. And right before evening prayer, we have a time of just kind of silence with scripture. So I was reviewing some of the Catholic social teaching scriptures. And as I did that, I just, I started to recognize a little bit of a pattern that, you know, ultimately we go back to Genesis chapter one, and why do we need this teaching to teach us how to live in community? Because of sin, uh, because of the rupture that happens in our human condition. And so um, just with that, like thinking about the seven deadly sins and how those kind of, in some ways, relate to each of the seven themes of Catholic social teaching. So in no particular order, uh, pride, I think pride goes along with rights and responsibilities, right? So when we think that everything is our right and we should just like go right, like really right happy, um, then we forget about the responsibilities that we also have. And so there's a real humility that's required to live out our rights and responsibilities. Um, I think that envy and like a, like a jealousy in some ways, it goes along with solidarity, recognizing that like if we live solidarity, then there's no need for envy and jealousy. And that so often when we're, when we're envious, that is a way that we undermine the importance of solidarity and recognizing the gifts of other people and recognizing other people's need for our gifts. Um, Human life and dignity, I think goes along with wrath, like wrath is like a, a vengeance and like a taking and a control. And so often human life is threatened with, um, with people wanting to control and to take rather than to give. Sloth uh, or sloth, depending upon how fancy you wanna be, but that, that I think goes along with, human, with um, dignity of work and the rights of workers because work keeps us more diligent. Diligent is the opposite virtue that goes against sloth. So uh, to work and to do something uh, would kind of kind of go against that. Um, Avarice, so greed, I think goes along with the stewardship of God's creation, right? Because so often, what are our problems in, in creation and in the environment come from people's greed? That, that's the Lorax to boot. Are you totally, if you know the story, you know the story. Um, but in the greed, then there, again, there's a taking and there's a use and there's a consumption um, as opposed to a using things well and a conservation. Gluttony would go against the preferential option for the poor, because if everyone actually just had what we needed and needed what we had, then we'd live in a better world, right? Um, and then lust would be a call to family, community, and participation. That when family life is lived well, then husbands and wives are loving each other well, they're not using each other, but there's a gift of self that's being offered, and then furthermore teaching the children that, that love is the opposite of use, and use is the opposite of love, and that we want to we wanna love people and Love is love conquers lust every single time. So anyway, um, Pope uh, Saint Paul, the, Saint Paul rather, in one of his letters, talks about how the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating or drinking, but the kingdom kingdom of God is a matter of joy and justice and love. And so I I'm mindful also of later on in the Galatians where he speaks of the, the fruit of the Holy Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self control. And when we're living those things, and when we're seeking to allow the Lord to cooperate in our hearts and to root out anything that's not of Him. Uh, to root out anything that is selfish, anything that puts us first, anything that uses another person, anything that makes us think that we're better than another person. When he roots those things out and he can plant his kingdom deeply within our hearts, then the tree of Catholic social teaching will grow in our own hearts and lives. Um, and, you know, as they say at the end of beauty pageants, like, I just want to make the world a better place. So I think the way to do that is through the beauty of Catholic social teaching that is not just agenda driven. Um, it's not just troubleshooting the world's problems, but it's really establishing a kingdom of God's love in our world today. So I'm going to go ahead and open it up for some questions. I'm not in any hurry. I know some people probably have to go because I just like went for it. Um, but I'm happy to, to be on here as long as anyone needs just to be able to field the questions that I can. But I will tell you that I, I'm going to, I probably will just refer you to some of your later speakers. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you so, so much. That was actually amazing. And some very on point uh, cultural references. Um, so if you, I don't know what you guys in the Newman Center like have devices or anything, but if you guys want to put them in the chat, maybe we can filter them through just so we have like coherence between online and in person. Yes, I agree with Jewel. That was absolutely amazing. Thank you so much. No problem.
Is that good, Jewel, if you guys just put them in the chat from in person? Yes, we're typing away over here. <laughs> so some, <laughs> some questions. Sorry, I don't know my computer here. literally just turned off. And um, Sister Wall, the Newman Center is unmuted. Let's give Sister a round of applause. That was so good. Thanks. Yeah, happy to be with you. And, and like I said, I haven't gotten to speak about this for a while. I've been out of a high school classroom for seven years, or for, no, for five years. So it's been, it's been a hot minute since I've done this. Just kind of a fun thing, because um, I was the cool theology teacher. And see, I taught seniors, this is a senior last semester. So their final project was to do a movie review. And so I would have them watch a movie. I had a list of about, oh gosh, probably by the end, it was probably about 120 movies to choose from. And they would have to watch it and then to identify the Catholic social teaching within it. Uh, and then tell me like, was it portrayed in a pot? Like, was it the positive or was it the via negativa? Or were we seeing the opposite where Catholic social teaching was needed to be lived out? And they would, they would design, this is like dating myself here. They would design like the DVD cover based on that and give it, a, give it a review. And so it could have as many as seven stars for the seven themes of Catholic social teaching. So anyway, it was a lot of fun. And it was a really great project for me to grade because I didn't have to grade tests and that's who wants to do that. Okay, so we've got um, a couple questions coming in. Yes, we do. Um, just a real simple one, real quick. Would you mind sharing your contact information for everyone here too? Sure, absolutely. Would it be the best if I put it in the chat? Um, yeah, you can put it in the chat and then we can save it and then like disperse it on our side too. Sure. So I'm just gonna put my email address in there. It's the best way to get in touch with me. Okay. So I'll then give you my office phone number too, yeah, just for fun. <laughs> Also, recreation is happening right now and they're playing pickleball outside. I try not to be jealous. <laughs> okay, so the first question was, um, if we talk about our values in Catholic social teaching with other people, how should we tell them if they share different values than us? Sure. I think it's important to, to define values, right? Like I think that uh, most people in society wanna be a good person and they want what's best for the world. Um, and so, so much of Catholic social teaching is not necessarily rooted in divine revelation as much as it is, as it is rooted in natural law. Uh, so in some ways, it's, it's hard to have this conversation without a philosophy background, and I'm terrible with philosophy, um, but just like getting at the heart of natural law and just like what is good um, or like the problem with moral relativism, right, where we start to talk about like, well, what is truth? And if we say like, what's well, true for you is true for you and what's true for me is true for me, then if I say that it's better that you're dead, like, would you agree with that? And they'll say, well, no. When you say, well, yeah, but like, I mean, well, what's true for me is true for me. So kind of getting it at the fallacy of relativism, I think is really important, but you might just be thinking like, well, they're not, they're not Catholic. They're not Christian even. So how would, how would they, maybe, maybe they do, they wouldn't necessarily have a relativistic outlook, but they just wouldn't necessarily have the background. Then I think you could just get it at the, at the natural law. Like, I think most people can agree that it's bad to, to murder someone, I think pretty much across the board. So kind of starting with something that's common ground across the board and then kind of going deeper and using that as a jumping off point. I hope that's helpful. Okay, um, the next question was, did the church have any focus on social teaching before 1981? Yeah, so I, I think it, it was 1891 as Rerum Novarum's. That probably would be the first time that the church like inserts herself into the conversation on social teaching in general. Um, but again, going back to scripture, going back to the Acts of the Apostles, there was a social teaching happening in the Acts of the Apostles, but it wasn't explicitly called that and it wasn't explicitly understood as that until much later. So yeah, 1891. Um, what would you say is the most important branch of Catholic social teaching for our society to focus on improving? Yeah, I think we just got to go back to basics, right? That like, we actually wouldn't have problems with, with poverty if we understood the dignity of the human person. We actually wouldn't have problems with, uh, with, with things like, you know, anything that would go against solidarity if we could just go back to the, the dignity of the human person. So I think first and foremost, we need to always be improving that. And that begins with our, an examination of conscience for ourselves even. Like, you know, maybe I'm not going out and killing somebody every day, but, or like ever for the record, um, <laughs> but, but you know, just like, how am I upholding the dignity of the human person in my daily interactions? 
Like, is there a way that I look at someone more for what they can do for me than as a, as a creation, as a, as a fellow daughter of the father, as a father, fellow son of the father? Um, so the more that we can do that. And again, one of the ways that I just kind of try to do that is by going through a checkout line with a human person. And it's a simple thing. And it, it sometimes is a penance for me, but it's a penance that's worth, worth me investing in um, because it helps me to slow down. Uh, I read a book recently called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. And so often we hurry, 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 and it's the expense of cutting out a person. And, um, and so, yeah, like just as a little, as a little penance to make sure that I'm putting a person in front of me every chance I can uh, to be able to love them as they are. So, yeah. That's actually like a perfect segue because uh, Caitlin made a comment um, in the comments about how the self-checkout is a great perspective. She said, I love, I feel the same way. I'll definitely stand in line for a real human connection from here on out. Thank you, sister. Thanks, Caitlin. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, you never know who, and for me, because I wear this habit all the time, like I just never know who I'm going to meet in the checkout line. Like I've been, I've been sitting there praying with someone in the middle of a grocery store before. Um, so yeah, I never want to, I never want to miss out on that opportunity. Um, the next question was, if you wanted to concisely look up what the church teaches on a social issue, what is the best source to turn to? Yeah, I would, I would hold up for you again, either the compendium on social issues of the church or the catechism. Um, maybe start with the catechism. This is probably more readily accessible, although I think both both documents are available on the Vatican website. Um, so, and again, the, the most recent issue of this is 2009. There may be a more recent one, but I've been out of the business for the last five years, so I don't know. It, it, for, what it, for what it's worth, though, like it's definitely the things that you need are there. I, I think, though, that there are, are continually things that are, that are developing. There's not a whole lot on gender in the catechism or in the compendium on, on social teaching, but that's something that the church is continuing to kind of study and to, to put together resources and an, and an understanding. Like, how do we understand that in light of revelation and in light of our current situation? Um, speaking to someone who isn't Christian or doesn't believe in God, how would we explain the basis for dignity of the human person? So this just in general is something that I found a lot in any kind of apologetic work, whether it's understanding, like helping someone to understand the church's teaching about anything um, or just about God in general, is that the best way to go about these conversations is less about what I'm going to tell someone and more about what I'm going to ask them and more about what they're going to tell me. Um, so asking them, like, well, what does it mean to be human to you? Like, how would you describe a human person? And kind of starting, starting at that level and giving them the floor so that you can kind of understand like what their like what their take is like if you don't believe in God, then then what is it what is it the meaning of life like what's the purpose of life and kind of starting there, and as you begin to understand where they're coming from to be able to speak truth into that, that's that's not as specific. I would need probably a little bit more of a specific um, scenario or situation, but again, hopefully your night that you'll have on the life issues will also give you some some things that are based in natural law. There is a project. Oh gosh. Uh, I don't know, it's like either called the abortion dialogue project or something else where their whole thing was to teach the perspective like to teach the church's teaching on human life without ever bringing up jesus god church like um so like really from a scientific perspective in a very real way which kind of surprises people too like i would say that the church's understanding of science and the church's relationship with science also can be found in catholic social teaching so Did you paint any of the pictures behind you? I did paint some of the pictures behind me. So the lion that's there on the wall, there, like you can't really see. Hang on. I'm going to get a better lion anyway. Um, this is my best lion ever. I really like lions because of the lion of the tribe of Judah, who's Jesus, but slash also the Chronicles of Narnia. So I wanted to paint Aslan. And um, I was like, ah, oh, I just want to like capture his tenderness, but also his strength. And I painted, I had a really nice canvas. It was like a big one. And I did it and I was like, man, it's okay. And then I had this chintzy little board canvas and this came out of my brush. And I feel like I captured the tenderness and, and the strength of Aslan in that one. My most recent one is a good shepherd. Oh. That was my, uh, that was my foray into grid drawing and painting. Um, I don't know if anyone's familiar with Life Teen Ministries uh, or like Life Teen Camps down in Georgia, Camp Covecrest, Camp Hidden Lake, but this is the stained glass window from Camp Covecrest and I spend a lot of time there and help train missionaries there and stuff like that. So that's gonna be uh, an ordination gift for a priest that will be ordained this year that I met when he was a, a summer missionary at camp, so. I dabble. <laughs> 
wood burning too. Wood burning is a new little little hobby of mine. Uh, oh. Do you have any seven star book or movie rec? Oh. You have oh, any seven, seven star, star book or movie reference? Ooh. Yeah. Oh. Oh gosh. It's been a while since I've read those um those papers. But I on uh, newsies. I mean you can't go wrong with newsies. That's a that's for sure. That's five stars at least. Um I am David is like a, a very it's not like a super well-known movie um but it came out probably in the early 2000s there's a book a book by that same title as well i feel like i'm frozen i'm seeing lots of frozen people um i'm just gonna give it a second here you're good on my side oh, you're good okay good you're, you're all moving now um so yeah i am david is phenomenal um of gods and men is a is a foreign film it's a, it's a french film with english subtitles and it's about a, some monks in algeria it's like a war-torn uh, time with two warring Islamic factions in the town. And that's just a good, it's just a good movie, period. It's an artsy movie. So you can't watch it like I'm watching it to get like a real, you know, like action-packed thriller. Um, but watch it like you're walking into an art museum for a couple hours. And that's a phenomenal, phenomenal look at discernment and grappling with the signs of the times and grappling with how do we navigate our situation when it's difficult. And uh, yeah, so. Yeah, it's been, it's been a really long time since I've, done those those book reviews which character from Parks and Rec do I identify with the most oh do I identify with or do I love because I just I just love Rachel, April and Andy I, I think I just they crack me up but I'm not like them at all I'm probably more Leslie for sure just kind of that go-getter and like what's that thing like Leslie Nope's friendship um, her like her way of like just knowing things about people and like remembering things and like commemorating anniversaries I totally have that so have you gotten through all seven seasons I have gotten through all seven seasons <laughs> yeah yeah what a time what a time totally worth it <laughs> have you all watched the show doing uh, making it it's like a it was like a yeah. reality show with Ron with um Nick Offerman and um yeah, Leslie Nope was whatever her real name is. I can't think of it at the moment because it's getting late for me. Um, but yeah, it's like a it's like a reality show where they people come on and they craft and it's like a crafting competition show. So if I were ever gonna be on a reality show, that would be the one for sure. Yeah, and they kept it up during COVID and did like a virtual competition and they gave you like things to find around the house that you had to make. Nice. It, it, the first time it like it premiered when I was on my home visit a couple years ago and my parents and I watched it the whole the whole series it was great you froze for me for a second and okay I think I think it's back now all right perfect Maybe? do we have any more Question questions mark? okay no okay perfect thank you so so much again that was absolutely amazing um, do you mind closing us in prayer tonight? I'm sorry, you cut out there for a second. Oh, sorry. Am I back now? Yeah, you're back. Okay. I said thank you so, so much again. It was absolutely amazing. Um, do you mind closing us out in a prayer tonight before we all go? Okay, you were going in and out, but I think you were asking me to lead a closing prayer. Yes. Okay, <laughs> great. Yes, I would love to leave a, lead a closing prayer. Let's go ahead and do that. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Oh, Heavenly Father, we just praise you and thank you for your goodness. We thank you for the gift of your light and the gift of your revelation. We thank you for the gift of our humanity and for calling us to live as brothers and sisters in this world. Jesus, thank you for the gift of your church, who comes as mother and teacher to help us to understand and to navigate the vicissitudes of this life uh, with your light and your truth and the power of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, come and come.
Oh, sister, I think you're on mute. Sorry. <laughs> How muted was my prayer? The, like the whole thing? Cool. <laughs> well, Lord, thank you for mute buttons and technology and for all the things. Um, so we turn to you, as I was saying, as you heard me say, we turn to you and we offer you the prayer that your son taught us as the prayer of the kingdom, the prayer where we boldly proclaim our sonship and our daughterhood in your name, the prayer through which we ask that you would establish your will and your kingdom here on earth. And so we pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Great. Thank you so, so much again. And thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Week two will be a preferential option for the poor. So stick around for that. And if you want to get in touch with Sister, her information is in the chat, or we have it, and you can just text me or Jewel, and we can disperse that. Thank you so much, for everyone. For sure. Thank you, sister, so much. Yay. Yes.